Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India Hello and welcome to today's lecture. In the last lecture, we covered soft tissue infections essentially caused by staphylococci. In today's lecture, we are trying to cover a more serious infection that is that caused by Clostridium. During the lecture, we will discuss the clinical presentations of Clostridial infections and enumerate Clostridia causing myositis. We will also discuss the clinical presentation, laboratory diagnosis and management of a patient presenting with the gas gangrene. We will discuss and understand what is an anaerobic organism and discuss the different methods to grow them. Now, clostridial infections of the soft tissue usually go through three phases, four phases actually and they may stop at any of those four phases. They start with wound contamination, where the clostridia are present in the wound, they do not really produce a toxin, but they may delay wound healing. The next phase after this would be if the clostridia proceed to cause cellulitis, they invade the facial planes, they produce minimum toxin. A little bit of gas may be seen around the wound, but the patient is still not toxic. After this, there is invasion into the deeper muscles and myositis starts because of invasion of the healthy muscles. The muscles start getting necrosed because of various toxins and enzymes produced by the bacteria and we get clostridial myonecrosis which presents to us with full flesh gas gangrene. The clostridia which cause clostridial myositis, the three of them are known to definitely cause my clostridial myositis. The three important ones are clostridium perfringens, clostridium septicum and clostridium novi. Less pathogenic than them are clostridium hysteroticum and clostridium phallus. Clostridium bifermentans and clostridium sporogenes are often seen in combination with any of the above clostridia and often the gas gangrene is caused by a mixed clostridial infection. Last week, a 35-year-old male was brought into the hospital with pain and swelling of the left leg. He gave a history of a road accident five days back, which was clean, dressed and sutured at the primary health centre. The leg started becoming painful two days back and increased in size. He had fever since the last one day and appeared confused. There was no history of hypertension, diabetes or tuberculosis. On clinical examination, the patient was seen to be confused and disoriented. He had a temperature of 101 degrees Fahrenheit, his blood pressure was 90 by 70 millimeters of mercury, pulse was 110 per minute. On examination of the wound, there was a blackish discoloration of the foot. A sutured lacerated wound was seen above the ankle with zero sanguineous discharge, which was foul smelling. The foot was tender and swollen up till the mid calf region. There was crepitus around the wound. Now, what exactly is crepitus? If you press the soft tissue around the wound, you will get the feeling of gas escaping in the soft tissue. This is what is described as crepitus. On systemic examination, no abnormality was detected. The sutures were first removed. Extensive debridement was done under general anesthesia. Patient was put onto intravenous metronidazole and clindamycin. Anti-gas gangrene serum was administered. He was exposed to hyperbaric oxygen in a hyperbaric chamber and laboratory investigations sent. The laboratory investigations which were sent were fasting blood sugar, total and differential count, blood urea and serum creatinine and CPK to confirm myositis. Blood sugar was normal, total counts were raised with neutrophilia, blood urea and serum creatinine were normal, CPK was raised and tissue from the edge of the wound, the necrotic area was taken and sent for culture for aerobic and anaerobic organisms. This is a hyperbaric chamber in which the patient's foot was put inside and he was exposed to high pressure oxygen. So, that way there was an attempt was made to save the limb of the patient. The organisms which usually cause myositis apart from the clostridia are the bacteroids which is an anaerobe also, the peptostreptococci which is also an anaerobe, microaerophilic streptococci and Klebsiella pneumoniae can also mimic clostridial myositis but the patient will not be so toxic as it would be in the clostridial infections. The sample which was received by the laboratory was from the depth of the wound. A smear was made from this and gram stain was done. A large number of regularly stained stout gram positive bacilli without spores were seen. Very few pus cells were seen in the smear and 
a hint of a capsule was seen around all the organisms. So, it gives what is described typically as a box car appearance. If you see a box car from the top, this sort of an appearance is seen because the large fat stout gram positive bacilli was seen with a hint of a capsule around it. This suggested that the organism which was causing the infection could be Clostridium perfringens. In the same smear, large bacteria with subterminal overspores were also seen. This was suggestive of Clostridium novi. So, it was probably a mixed infection with Clostridium perfringens and Clostridium novi. Citron bodies, boat leaf shape, were not seen. This is characteristic of Clostridium septicum. These are the boat shaped structures which we were looking for, but they were not seen in this smear. Instead, we only saw bacteria with subterminal spores. So, the organism of Clostridium septicum was not detected in the current smear. The sample which had been collected was also transported to the laboratory in transport medium. The transport medium which were given to the clinicians were the thioglycolate medium and the Robertson's cooked meat medium. The thioglycolate medium is a transport medium, the Robertson's cooked meat medium is an enriched medium and sometimes is more helpful in early isolation of Clostridia. When the samples were brought to the laboratory, after 4 hours of incubation in Robertson's cooked meat medium, they were plated onto blood agar and McConkey's agar which was incubated aerobically for 18 hours to look for the infecting aerobic organism. It was also plated on chocolate agar which was incubated at 5 to 10 percent carbon dioxide to look for the micro aerophilic organisms. Colonies were examined the next day, all isolates obtained were identified by biochemical tests. The sample was also plated onto a blood agar, onto a neomycin blood agar, an egg yolk agar medium which is called, called as Willys and Hobb medium and the same medium another plate of it with half antitoxin on the plate and all these plates were kept for anaerobic incubation for 48 hours. Now, why were these plates kept for anaerobic incubation? Because Clostridia are anaerobes. Now, what is an anaerobe? An anaerobic organism is an organism that does not require oxygen for growth. Now, this is a little difficult to believe because most living organisms require oxygen before they can grow. But there is a set of organisms, microorganisms which actually do not require oxygen and some of them actually lethal, oxygen is lethal to them and they may even be killed in the presence of oxygen. So, depending on their oxygen requirement, they are classified into strict anaerobes, moderate anaerobes, mild anaerobes and micro aerophilic. Micro aerophilic are organisms which are they require a partial pressure of oxygen just a little below 23 percent that is 20 to 23 percent. The other end of the spectrum that is the strict anaerobes require a partial pressure of oxygen less than 0.3 percent in their environment. Most of the human pathogens fortunately are moderate anaerobes and they require a partial pressure of oxygen of 0.3 to 2 percent. The mild anaerobes can grow between 2 to 20 percent of oxygen. Now, this is best demonstrated by these four set of tubes. If you see the first tube, you will find that all the growth is at the surface of the medium. This is an obligatory aerobic bacteria because it will grow at the surface where there is lot of oxygen. In the second tube, you will see all the organisms have grown at the bottom of the tube where the amount of oxygen is much less. So, these are the obligatory anaerobic organisms. In the third tube, you will find organisms dispersed all over the tube with little more of them at the surface. These are the facultative bacteria. Most of our gram negative organisms which cause infections are facultative bacteria. So, they can grow in aerobic conditions and in anaerobic conditions, but they prefer to grow in aerobic conditions. The last group is a micro aerophilic organism which grow a little below the surface of the tube. So, they require little less oxygen content as compared to the rest of the organisms. Now, why are these bacteria anaerobic? Most life as we all know it requires oxygen, but some bacteria are actually anaerobic because they lack the enzyme superoxide dismutase. And so, in the presence of oxygen, toxic superoxides accumulate in the cell and kill the cell. The respiratory enzymes of these particular bacteria are also active in a reduced state. In fact, some of them are not able to even live in the presence of the dissolved oxygen which is there in the medium. This dissolved oxygen in the medium increases its redox and thus inhibits the growth of some strict anaerobes. What is this redox potential which I am talking of? This redox potential is often denoted by the letters capital E and small h just like the hydrogen ion concentration is denoted by the letters P and H. It is a measure of the tendency of the medium to acquire electrons or give up electrons. When it gives up electrons, it becomes reduced. When it takes up electrons, it becomes oxidized. The reduction potential is measured in millivolts and is designated as E H. 1 E H is equal to 1 millivolt. Anaerobes grow in media where the E H is negative, while aerobes prefer to go in media where the E H is positive. Now, how can you actually measure the EH of a medium? It can be measured 
the reduction potential of media are determined by measuring the potential difference between a sensing electrode in contact with the medium and a stable reference electrode. You can also have indicators of EH just like you have indicators of pH. You have indicators of pH like bromothymol turning from blue to pink when it is blue to yellow when it there is acid production. We have the andride medium which turns from light yellow to pink when there is acid production. Similarly, in EH indicators, resazurin which is normally pink in color becomes colorless when the EH falls down to minus 300 millivolts. Methylene blue becomes colorless at minus 2 millivolts. So, when we are trying to grow moderate anaerobes, we use methylene blue as an indicator, so which will become colorless when the EH comes down to minus 2 millivolts. Now, there can be various methods for creating anaerobiases. Over the years, simpler methods have been used displacement of oxygen. Since we do not require oxygen, the simplest thing would be to cultivate it in vacuum by using vacuum desiccators, but this often causes boiling of the medium and may be difficult to grow surface colonies. So, displacement of oxygen by other inert gases can be done. This is often used in the candle jar, where essentially the candle burns, utilizes the oxygen, produces carbon dioxide and the anaerobes can grow. But these are not very efficient methods and the stricter anaerobes would not grow by these methods, though the candle jar is used to grow micro aerophilic organisms. Absorption of oxygen by certain chemicals, certain chemicals are properties of absorbing oxygen in the environment. So, either in a tube or in a plate format, we mix together pyrogallic acid and sodium hydroxide. When they are mixed, they form alkaline pyrogallol. Now, this particular substance has a capacity to absorb oxygen in the environment and the bacteria can then grow easily in this environment. However, it is difficult to standardize and cannot be used again for the stricter anaerobes. We can also create anaerobiasis by reusing, reducing agents in the medium. It is not always necessary to remove all the oxygen in the medium. The reducing agents which could be used are glucose, glycolate, cysteine and ascorbic acid which are incorporated into many anaerobic medium. The commonly used Robertson's cooked meat medium or RCM as it is known as contains oxygen on the surface of the medium but it is still useful for anaerobes because it contains unsaturated fatty acids from the meat which utilize oxygen and it contains glutathione which is a reducing substance and decreases the EH of the medium making it suitable for anaerobes to grow. Biological methods can also be used by cultivating an aerobe on a plate and making it com combined with an anaerobe on the same plate or an on a plate by which the two plates are fused together or by growing anaerobes in the presence of respiring seedlings. However, these are imperfect techniques and not used for the stricter anaerobes. The currently used methods is the Macintosh field is jar. This is the picture of a Macintosh field jar. There is an inlet and there is an outlet. From the outlet, two third of the air in the jar is evacuated and hydrogen is introduced from the inlet. Now, this hydrogen which is introduced from the inlet combines with the remaining oxygen in the jar in the presence of palladinized alumina to form water. There is a secondary fall in the pressure in the jar and 5 to 10 percent CO2 is introduced to fill this negative pressure which has been created, thus creating an ideal environment for the anaerobes to grow. To test whether the jar has been set up properly and an ideal anaerobic environment has been maintained, an indicator is required. The indicator could be using a strict aerobe like Pseudomonas aeruginosa. If it grows, that means the jar has not been set up properly or using an anaerobe like the Clostridium tetani. If it grows, that means the jar has been set up properly. More commonly chemicals are used using a combination of sodium hydroxide, glucose and methylene blue. When this is boiled together, it is colorless and as it has a reduced EH. If it stays colorless, that means the jar has been set up properly. The same thing can be done in plastic jars where you need not create vacuum or pump out oxygen by using packs, ready made packs containing sodium borohydride, cobalt chloride, citric acid and sodium bicarbonate. When water is added to this pack, these chemicals mix with each other and they generate hydrogen and carbon dioxide which will fill the jar and the hydrogen will combine with the oxygen again in the presence of a catalyst to form water. Wherever more work is being done with anaerobic organisms the way we are trying to grow stricter anaerobes, no exposure is required to the organism. So, they are grown in anaerobic glove boxes. This is an anaerobic glove box which is has nitrogen gas circulating right through it and you can work through the glove openings here and work inside the cabinet so that you are sure that at a no stage is the organism exposed to oxygen. Now, these plates were kept in the Macintosh field -based jar and the colonies were examined after 48 hours. 2 to 4 millimeter colonies were obtained on blood agar. The colonies were irregular which showing target hemolysis. 
Now, what is target hemolysis? There is a zone of beta hemolysis surrounded by a zone of alpha hemolysis. Initially, the zone of beta hemolysis is small and the alpha hemolysis is longer. As the incubation period increases, we will find that the zone of beta hemolysis increases and the alpha hemolysis decreases. It is called target hemolysis because it looks like the target at which we practice when we are trying to learn shooting. Mm. Now, this same property of the organism can be used to identify the organism in a test known as the reverse camp test. The word camp comes from the names of three scientists who devised the test Christy Atkins and Munch Peterson. These scientists use the test to identify beta streptococci initially. The other medium which was used for growing the clostridia was the Willis and Hobb medium containing egg yolk. Now, in this egg yolk maintaining medium, the organism produces an toxin lecithinase in nature. The lecithinase in the toxin breaks down the lecithin in the medium and reduce produces phosphoryl chlorine and diglycerides in the presence of calcium and magnesium ions. This results in this opacity which you see around the colonies. In the second play picture, you can see on half the plate antitoxin or anti gas gangrene serum has been put and streaks of the culture have been put across the medium. Now, the opacity which is present on the side where there is no anti gas gangrene serum is inhibited on the other side while the bacterial growth has not been inhibited as an antitoxin substance has been required applied on the other side and not an antibacterial substance. This is diagnostic of Clostridium perfringens and you get an angular reaction sometimes within 24 hours. So, the clinicians can be immediately told that they are dealing with a Clostridium perfringens infection and they can take adequate precautions for the patient and for the hospital environment. Smear from the colonies which were obtained was made. Now, gram positive pleomorphic organisms were seen. Pleomorphic is various variations in size were seen. Some were very small, some were very large. 2 to 4 microns by 1 micron, they were plump rods with central, some are having central spores and some having subterminal spores. Now, the same organism did not produce any spores when it was seen in the direct smear, but it produced spores when it was seen from the culture. So, that is the characteristic again of Clostridium perfringens, which rarely produces spores in tissues. So, on a direct smear, you will never see a spore, but in the culture, you will see a spore. Specifically in Robust's cooked meat medium, you can see the spore sporulation of the organism easily. The organism was capsulated and non motile. At the same time, a litmus milk was inoculated. The litmus milk, which is normally light moved to purple in color, when it is inoculated with Clostridium perfringens, the lactose is broken down giving acid production which gives the pink color to the medium. The casein is clotted and lot of gas is produced because this excess gas which is produced you get an appearance which is described as the stormy clot appearance. This picture shows a stormy clot appearance with due to the growth of Clostridium perfringens in the current case. So, the organism because of all the above pictures it showed that is the reverse cam positive, the Nagler reaction and the stormy clot appearance was labeled as Clostridium perfringens. Since it has a standard sensitivity and resistance has not been reported, the drug of choice is penicillin and metronidazole. The patient became toxic however, so the leg had to be amputated. This is very very important thus to give a diagnosis of Clostridium well in time because if the leg is not amputated early, the, patient, the infection will go higher and higher and it will become fatal for the patient. In patients we having streptococcal myositis which resembles Clostridial myositis, the patient will respond dramatically to treatment and amputation may not be required. So, sometimes a simple gram stain may help save the limb of the patient. Another organism which could also produce a similar clinical picture is the Clostridium septicum though it was not there in this patient. This particular organism is a gram positive plump rod, boat shaped citron bodies are formed with this particular organism in the direct smear which we saw earlier. The organism when it is plated on blood agar will not give you beta hemolysis. This is what differentiates it from Clostridium perfringens. It gives you no opacity on egg yolk. Unlike Clostridium perfringens, which give you a clear opacity around the colonies on egg yolk. So, these are the colonies on blood agar. You will see that there is no opacity around the colonies, and these are the colonies on the egg yolk medium. There is no opacity around the colony. You see irregular colonies, which are almost feathery in appearance, but there is no opacity around them. So, they do not give a Nagler reaction. The third important pathogen which causes Clostridial myositis is Clostridium novi. This is a gram positive plump rod with subterminal spores. On plating it on Willis and Hobb medium or egg yolk medium, we will see an opacity around the colonies, but in addition to the opacity around the colonies, there will be a shiny layer on the surface of the colony because of a lipase which the organism produces. This shiny layer on the surface of the colony gives you almost like 
oil in water appearance. When a drop of oil falls in water, the multicolored appearance which you see on the surface of the water, the appearance you see of these colonies, it gives it a lipase reaction positive. This was not seen with Clostridium perfringens, so this is characteristic of Clostridium novi. Now, when you use a Nagler reaction using a polyvalent antiserum against novi also you will get a Nagler reaction positive and both the opacity and the lipase reaction would be inhibited on the other side. Actually Clostridia overall can be divided on the basis of their spore shape and their position. Examples of either you can have a central spore which would be Clostridium bifermentans, a subterminal spore which could example of which is a Clostridium perfringens, a terminal oval spore which could be Clostridium tertium and a terminal spherical spore which could be Clostridium tetani. Then organism itself with the word Clostridium arises from the word spindle shaped because the spore of the Clostridia is larger than the size of the bacterial body. So, wherever the spore is present in the body there will be a little bulge of the bacteria. So, the organism gets its name from that as spindle shaped or the word Clostridium. Now, again based on its biochemical properties also they can be divided into sacrolytic, proteolytic, sacrolytic and proteolytic or neither sacrolytic or proteolytic. Now, how do we look for this sacrolytic or proteolytic activity? If you inoculate the organism into Robertson's cooked meat medium, a sacrolytic organism will cause reddening of the meat, while a proteolytic organism will cause digestion and blackening of the meat. So, on the basis of the appearance on Robertson's cooked meat medium, the organism could be divided into one of these four categories. Now, how do these Clostridia actually ca cause problems in the subcutaneous tissue? A wound which is contaminated with soil, shell fragments, bullets, bits of clothing is a Clostridia prone wound and it this all these uh, contaminants in the wound facilitate Clostridial infection. Ionized calcium salts silicic acid from the soil can also cause necrosis because generally in a road accident the wound would have some bit of soil present in it from the surrounding area. So, this causes necrosis. Now, in this particular patient the wound had been immediately sutured. So, because the wound had been sutured, a more of an anaerobic environment had been created and there was more chances of the Clostridia present in the wound multiplying and causing toxin production. Then crushing and tearing of arteries which also can occur in an accident will result in decreased blood supply and produce anoxia of the muscle. An anaerobic reduction of pyruvate to lactate in the muscles will result in a fall in EH and facilitate the growth of Clostridia. Not only these anaerobic conditions facilitate the growth of Clostridia, they also cause increase in toxin production and increase in enzymes by the Clostridia which causes the massive tissue damage which you see in gas gangrene. Now, what are these virulence factors which cause this tissue damage? The most important of them are the toxins, out of which the most important toxin is the alpha toxin which is lecithinase in nature. This is what gives the opacity around the colonies because which we detect in the Nagler reaction. So, this is the most important toxin which is produced and this acts also in the body and causes breakdown of lecithin in the skin. The beta toxin is necrotizing, the epsilon toxin increases the vascular permeability in that area and the RBC the blood flows out out of the capillaries. The iota toxin is necrotic and again also increases vascular permeability. So, these are the four major toxins of Clostridium perfringens alpha toxin, beta toxin, epsilon and iota. All Clostridia produce similar toxins which help them in their virulence. Other toxins which are produced are the gamma and eta toxin which are minor and lethal, the delta and theta toxin which is hemolytic and cytolytic, the kappa toxin which is collagenase, breaks down the collagen in the tissue. So, that causes tissue damage, the lambda which is proteinase and gelatinase, the mu which is hyaluronidase which helps it spread over in the tissue and the toxin spreads upwards and upwards and unless you do an application fast the toxin keeps spreading higher and higher and new or the deoxyribonuclease. Apart from these major toxins it also produces some enzymes which also help in break down local tissue and help it in its pathogenesis. One is the fibrinolysin which breaks down the fibrin in the tissues, a bursting factor which actually causes bursting of the muscles cells. Now, this characteristic muscle lesions in gas gangrene are because of this bursting factor. Hemolysin and hemoglutinins act on the RBCs, neuraminidase acts on the receptors on the RBCs and a circulating factor which is released which inhibits phagocytosis. So, you do not see many uh, phagocytes also in and around the clostridial infection. Apart from this severe form of clostridial perfringens that is the clostridial myositis, clostridium perfringens can also cause a few other diseases. The common disease which is not so critical is the food poisoning a more critical form of it is a necrotizing enteritis, biliary tract infections, brain abscesses, meningitis, 
panophthalmitis, thoracic infections and urogenital infections can be caused by clostridium perfringens also. The ideal treatment for uh, myositis is surgery. The wound has to be made aerobic essentially. Suturing the wound is creating an anaerobic environment and is absolutely contraindicated. All the dead and damaged tissue has to be removed and the patient the wound has to be kept open. Exposure to hyperbaric oxygen prevents the multiplication of clostridia and even prevents them from producing their toxin. Antibiotic treatment essentially metrodozole and penicillin are drugs of choice. Additionally, gentamicin and amoxicillin or amoxicillin clavulonic acid may be added to cover the aerobes. Anti gas gangrene serum has to be used for therapy. A polyvalent serum is available containing 10,000 units of Clostridium perfringen, Clostridium novi, and 5,000 units of septicum. So, even before the diagnosis of which Clostridia is available with the clinicians, this anti gas gangrene serum can be injected into the patient intravenously and the patient starts responding. For prophylaxis also the anti gas gangrene serum can be given that is why I have referred to it as passive immunization also. For prophylaxis it is given intramuscularly for any deep road accident where there is a, or a crush injury which is likely to have been contaminated with soil. So, this anti gas gangrene serum if given intramuscularly will prevent the multiplication and spread of toxin in these patients and will save the patient from clostridial myositis. Now, these are the references for some of the figures I have used. Majority of the figures are from the Department of Microbiology at BJ Medical College. A very few of them have been taken from the internet and the references for these are shown in this list. Thank you.